Morning, everyone. This is Barry Knapp with Ironsides Macroeconomics. It's June, Monday morning, June 1st. Uh, our report this week was titled Accelerating Capital Investment. We released it on Saturday morning, May 29th at the beginning of the Memorial Day weekend. This is our weekly podcast, also video produced with the help from our friends at Nucleus 195. It'll be on our uh, YouTube channel as well. And um, we hope everyone had a, a nice long weekend and paid the respect to our, our fallen heroes. Um, there's five sections to the note this week. Uh, the first one was a reflation revival, which is really a fiscal policy review and uh, uh, our outlook around that. We had a section on the Fed RRP program. This is a nearly 400 billion draining of reserves that some uh, uh, we think misinterpreted. Um, a revival, early stages anyway, of a revival of the trade war between the U.S. and China, uh, a section on accelerating capital investment, which was the main theme of the report this week, or uh, highlight, if you will, and then um, a payroll preview ahead of this Friday's crucial uh, May non-farm payroll report. So first on the refresh, uh, reflation revival um, Biden, President Biden released his budget on Friday morning. It was leaked on Thursday. There was a very sharp reaction in the back end of the bond market, as we'd been expecting. Uh, a, the rally in rates to resume, driven by long-term rates, when it became clear that there was not going to be a bipartisan infrastructure plan. Right now, the bid ask between what the Republicans are willing to spend in additional funds and what the Democrats want to spend, the Biden administration at least, is uh, 300 billion versus 1.7 trillion. So this is just a uh, pretty wide bid ask spread. And we, we do believe the talks will collapse this week. The Democrats will go on their way. They'll file for reconciliation, uh, looking to expand the deficit by at least another trillion dollars, maybe as much as, uh, as two. And um, our first chart here shows infrastructure investment. Um, it's available on our weekly with all the details, but it shows how the vast majority of infrastructure investment has been done at the state level for many years. There's been a drifting lower of the percent contribution of the federal government, but it's never been much more than 10% of total infrastructure spending. So this is, uh, uh, if we had our druthers, they'd be sending the money down to the states and you know, earmarking it for infrastructure investment, and that's how it would get done. But that notwithstanding, we think this is going to fall apart, and that's going to be the catalyst for a move higher in rates. As we wrote in the prior week, the move that we had, the impulsive move in rates that we had at the beginning of the year really was driven by the blue wave and the $1.9 trillion American uh, recovery plan. It's the first time in our career we really witnessed the bond market repricing to absorb excess supply. So we think that we're due for another round of that. Moving on to the Fed RRP program, there's been a $400 billion increase in that program. Some viewed it as a stealth uh, tightening or taper type of program. It's not really what's going on. We, we talked a lot about uh, in the past last couple of months about that Treasury general account and how uh, they Treasury needed to draw those balances down. That put a lot of reserves into the banking system. QEs put a lot of reserves into the banking system. And there was so much money floating around that repo rates could have gone negative. This RRP program is basically de putting deposits at the Fed at zero, which is better than, you know, loaning them out for negative rates just to get them off your balance sheet to deal with the supplementary leverage ratio or temporary loss absorbing capital ratios, all of these ratios that put total caps on bank leverage. And so it, it doesn't have any real uh, market impact right now, much as we thought back during not QE prior to the pandemic that the Fed injection of overnight repos had very little spillover effect into other markets, but that the, the um, purchase of bills, the permanent purchase of bills did. This is very similar. It, it's just a technical operation, but it does speak to issues around bank profitability and the Fed really needing to sort out this uh, not granting an exemption to reserves from the total calculation of this ratio. If the Fed's going to pump money into the system and the banks have to hold on to that cash, 
earning no money on it, it is going to be a drag on profitability, which will impair credit creation and crowd out private sector investment and loans over time. So probably too much on that technical aspect. Uh, moving on to the trade war, um, we don't think that the PBOC and Chinese central government decision to start weakening the yuan is unrelated to things like the Biden administration flip-flopping on the Wuhan lab leak theory. This is the early stages of the revival of the trade war. The Chinese have not made good on their promises in that trade agreement with the Trump administration. And um, this is really going to heat up. The Biden administration is not going to back off from that. And we think like interest rate vol, uh, FX vol is cheap. And so there are places we would consider uh, being long FX vol, because as the pandemic recedes, uh, we do think that this is going to be a feature of the markets and will cause occasional risk-off shocks. Uh, moving on to the CapEx part of the report, which um, is really the lasting theme of what we were writing about this week. Last week, we saw much stronger than expected core capital goods orders from the April Durable Goods Report. Uh, CapEx plans from the Regional Fed Manufacturing Surveys, which is our leading indicator for capital spending, not just for equipment, but for software, for R&D, and for structures investment, uh, is back at uh, 2018 highs prior to the trade war. We got um, uh, a number of those regional Fed manufacturing surveys last week. We get one more this morning from Dallas. But we have capital spending plans at a level that we think implies that CapEx, the CapEx recovery is really just getting started within the first quarter GDP number. We saw a sharp upward revision to software and R&D spending. We've certainly seen that from a bottoms up perspective, S&P 500 R&D spending is back to the 2018, 2019 levels, which is much better than it was throughout that decade of the tens or the O's or even the nineties tech boom. Um, so we've got a, a, a decent bounce going there. And then a little bit of cycle theory on all this. Typically, you know, Austrian trade cycle theory would indicate that you should have a much sharper drop in capital spending, non-residential fixed investment, than you get in consumption. And that typically clears out the malinvestment. We didn't have that this go around, underscoring how weak the last decade's capital spending cycle was. And so we really are positioned for a very strong cycle. Hopefully the Biden administration um, tax plans won't derail that, but um, the secular case, economic case for a strong CapEx cycle we think is quite compelling. Uh, and that will be a big driver of productivity margins and will be very good news for the corporate sector. Even though inflation is picking up, remember reflation is not as insidious as inflation. In the early stages, uh, like the 60s, we should get a pretty good boom, which will be really good news for corporate profits. And then finally, moving on to payrolls, um, we've been noting how we've had this plunge in initial claims but very stable continuing claims, likely at least in part because of the expanded and extended unemployment programs. Uh, just to illustrate this point, in February, the weekly average for initial claims was 1.24 million. In March, 1.11. Uh, in April, 818,000. And in May, 610,000. For continuing claims, the same averages were 16.7 million in Feb, 17.3 million in March, 16.4 in April, and they've slipped to 15.7 uh, million in May. We think there's a very good chance that we could wind up with a, another big payroll print in May. Um, seasonal adjustment factors may have distorted the data a bit in April. And then finally, moving on, the conference board labor differential. This is a survey that's very similar to the survey that um, is used to derive the U3 unemployment rate or U6 underemployment rate, that surged in May and is pointing to a U3 unemployment rate of 3.8% and a U6 underemployment rate of 7%. Remember, cycle lows were 3.5 and 6.8. If nothing else, this indicates there was very little labor market scarring and there is plenty of jobs available for those who want them. The Dallas Fed has stated that they think there was 2.5 million early retirements as a consequence of the pandemic. That sounds about right to us, but uh, nonetheless, um, there is there is the uh, potential that we get a very strong print on Friday. And the street has curbed its enthusiasm around uh, the headline number. 
as opposed to looking for a million in April, that forecast is for something like 675,000, uh, only a fairly marginal fall in the um, U3 unemployment rate. And we will certainly be watching wages around the various sectors very carefully because as we've written quite a bit about, we think the labor market is much tighter than the Fed narrative that there's still 8 million fewer people working than there was pre-pandemic would imply. So um, lots, to, uh, lots to look at this week. And um, that payroll number looms very large. We do think it will take two very strong payroll reports to convince the leadership of the Fed that they ought to be tapering. But before we get to tapering and a tightening of uh, conditions, either in monetary or fiscal policy, we think we're about to get another fiscal policy surge. That'll spark reflation again. And so you should still be long you know, commodities, commodity-related equities, industrials, financials, uh, energy, and um, any of the related trades, yield curve steepeners uh, driven by the back end, puts on the various bond indices, including the corporate bond index. And that's how we would be positioned these next few weeks would be very interesting with respect to that. So Barry Knapp for Ryan Size Macroeconomics. If you don't already subscribe to this podcast, please do so. And uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And by all means, consider becoming a paid subscriber to our research where all the real facts be behind what we've just said resides. We've got some cool stuff coming out this week. We're going to put out a special report on the 60s analog. And um, uh, we, should, we think you'll find it really interesting. Barry Knapp, Ironsides Macro. Have a good week, everyone.